So remember that we're talking about persisting state over a stateless protocol. So that is obviously HTTP. Let's have a look at how the process of state persistence works. So we have a user and the user is going to log in to the application. So that request gets sent. The application then returns a token. Now this token is unique to the user. It's their very own one. Nobody else has the same token. Now persistence is then done by ensuring that when the user makes a subsequent request, the token is sent with it. And the server can look at the token and say, I know who you are. You're the person who just logged in. And it can then send a response which is appropriate to that user. The user makes another request. The token goes again, and then the server sends back a response, which effectively is an authenticated response. So it's a response made in the context of the user's identity. It knows who the user is because the user provided a valid token. So you can see how this sort of hacks around the problem of HTTP being stateless. And the challenge then becomes how that token is persisted on the user's end. And that's what we're going to look at when we get to cookies and URLs and form fields. But before we do that, there's one other thing that I want to look at, and it's what happens on the server side. So let's think about that request lifecycle from the previous slide in terms of what's going on on the server. So the server, which of course is where the application is running, receives a request that has the token. Now usually, and there are some exceptions to this that we are going to talk about throughout this course, but usually the server will then pull data about the session from a storage construct. Usually, and again, there are exceptions, but usually the token will be nothing more than a unique identifier that the server can then map back to data that it is persisting. Now this leads into the discussion of, well, how does the server persist data? Well, one option is it persists it in memory. And very often, session state on the server does just exist in memory. So for example, if you build an ASP.NET application, and many other technology stacks run the same, this is a technology agnostic course, but let's say it's ASP.NET, by default, it will store session state in memory. And in fact, it will store it in the context of the web server process that the site is running on. If you restart the web app, or even restart the entire server, the session state disappears, it's gone. It is volatile in that regard. So this model actually ties session data very closely to the web server process. Another mechanism of session persistence is via a state server. So this would be an independent process to the web app itself, a process dedicated for just persisting state. Yet another mechanism would be to store state in the database. And these are the three options that people would normally use in a web app, such as an ASP.NET website. But again, it's technology agnostic. There are similar paradigms for other frameworks. And these actually don't matter too much in the context of session hijacking. The point is that the server issues a token and the server is able to associate that token back to data that it persists somewhere on the back end. When the request comes in with the token, the server can retrieve that data and process it in the context of the user that it belongs to. Each person's data stored in session state should be specific to them. If you give the wrong person the wrong data, that could lead to a session hijacking attack. Because in this sort of model, that session data is usually storing the identity of the user. So you want to make sure that when John makes a request to the server, John gets John's session data. You don't want him getting Mary's session data, otherwise he may well be effectively impersonating Mary. And we have the session hijacking problem. So whilst we're not going to worry too much about these different mechanisms of storage, it is really important to recognize that protecting tokens and serving the right session data to the legitimate owner of that data is absolutely critical. Now, before we move on and actually start looking at demos of session persistence, I just want to clarify one little thing first. Session ID, token, and auth cookie. These terms can be used a little bit interchangeably. They can often mean the same thing, but they do have their own semantics. So for example, later on in the course, 
I'm going to show how in some frameworks the session ID is totally independent of the auth cookie. In other frameworks, they're exactly the same thing. So just take a note of these three terms and recognize that they do get used a little bit interchangeably, but that they can mean different things depending on the framework. And as we progress through the course, I'll make it really clear when I very specifically mean the unique attributes of one of these, as opposed to the generic term, which just can refer to the piece of data that the client uses to identify themselves back to the server. Okay, with that understood, let's go and take a look at how session persistence is actually implemented in web apps.